Hello and welcome to module three. In module one, we talked about the hiring process. In module two, we discussed how to agree changes with the workforce. In this module, we're focusing on imposing change when the employee doesn't agree, including the process of dismissal and re-engagement. It can be difficult, sometimes impossible, to get an employee's agreement to detrimental contractual changes. Other than abandoning the proposed changes, which business needs will rarely allow, the employer's left with two options. Take a punt and impose the new terms unilaterally, that means on your own without agreement, or terminate the old contract and offer re-employment on the new terms. Neither option's without risk. So if you impose new terms without agreement, that's a breach of contract. What the employee does next is key. If the employee clearly objects, you might know where you stand. That might mean facing litigation. But more commonly, the employee might do nothing and simply carry on working without raising clear objections. And that conduct could indicate acceptance of the new terms. Difficulties arise, though, where there isn't any clarity. At what point will the employee be considered to have impliedly agreed to the change just by saying and to some extent doing nothing. The length of the delay in speaking up, together with how soon the effects of the change are felt, are they immediate, will be relevant. So in a case in the Employment Appeal Tribunal called Cartwright and Tetrad, the EAT found that employees who waited six months before objecting to a 5% pay cut had impliedly accepted that cut. The employees had been paid numerous times at the lower rate and failed to raise any objection. The Employment Appeal Tribunal said this was evidence that the employees had accepted the pay cut. So the longer an employee delays before raising an objection, the more likely it is that a tribunal will find that their actions imply acceptance of the new terms. But unfortunately, things aren't always as simple as that, as the case of, of, of Admiral Hall and Nottingham City Council shows. Employees at Nottingham City Council usually got an annual incremental pay rise. In 2011, the council imposed a two-year pay freeze. That meant that employees wouldn't receive their contractual incremental increases during that period. The recognised unions objected. They even balloted for industrial action, but they didn't get the necessary support. The unions made their objections clear in meetings with the council, but they didn't raise a formal dispute or a formal grievance. Two years went by, and two years on, in 2013, the council tried to extend the two-year pay freeze. And at that point, employees brought claims for unlawful deductions, that means non-payment, based on their contractual right to a pay rise. Now, if they'd accepted the 2011 pay freeze and waived their right to continuing to claim continuing deductions, they wouldn't win their claim. If they hadn't accepted the 2011 pay freeze, then they would win their claim. So had they accepted it or not? Well, no, said the Court of Appeal. The pay freeze hadn't been presented to employees as something they had to actively accept or reject. So although they'd continued working for two years without protest, the trade union had protested on their behalf, both at the time of the pay freeze and for several months afterwards. And it was, it was also relevant that employees had continued to work when the contractual change was of no benefit to them whatsoever. The Court of Appeal said a decision not to bring a legal claim or not to take industrial action was different from actively accepting new terms and conditions. And the employee's actions didn't show unequivocal acceptance. That's the phrase, unequivocal acceptance of the change to terms and conditions. So they were therefore entitled to backdated pay equivalent to what they would have earned if their pay hadn't been frozen. Now, this case seems a little bit surprising, given there have been others in which employees have worked in accordance with new terms for less time and been found to have accepted them. So it goes to show that there's not necessarily any consistency here in the way tribunals decide things. As with so many tribunal cases, it all depends on what the employment tribunal wants to do, what the employment judge thinks is fair, and whether there's an arguable, credible legal route for getting there. 
So don't mistake, this is the lesson to draw, don't as an employer mistake inaction for acceptance, particularly if the employees raised an initial objection. Let's talk about something called stand and sue and, and constructive dismissal. Instead of continuing to work, an employee might decide to stand and sue if an employer changes their contract. So that means they carry on working, but they make it clear they object to the contractual change. They might do it verbally or in writing or even through a trade union representative. And at the same time, at the same time as continuing to work, they bring tribunal proceedings for unlawful deductions from wages, assuming the issue relates to pay. Or they bring a claim for breach of contract in the civil courts. An employee's little, little nerdy point here, an employee's not allowed to bring a breach of contract claim in an employment tribunal until after their employment has ended. The employee can also bring a wrongful dismissal claim. They can say it's a breach of contract claim relating to notice pay if they resign without notice. Now, if the contractual change is serious enough to amount to a repudiatory breach of contract and they've worked for two years, it can also form the basis of a constructive dismissal claim. Remember, they can bring constructive dismissal claims based on a breach of the implied term of trust and confidence also. Now, a case called Mostyn against S&P Casuals explored the link between an employer imposing new contractual terms and constructive dismissal. Mr. Mostyn was employed as a sales executive. His sales figures had been suffering, but the company didn't carry out any formal capability process. Instead, it asked Mr. Mostyn to take a £20,000 pay cut. He refused, not entirely surprising, but the company said it was going to cut his pay anyway. Mr. Mostyn resigned. Mr. Mostyn claimed constructive dismissal. Now, he lost initially. The tribunal found that while the employer had behaved in a way that could damage trust and confidence, it had reasonable and proper cause for cutting his pay. So that didn't amount to a breach of trust and confidence. The tribunal took into account his poor sales figures and his lack of action to address that poor performance. Mr. Mostyn appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which found in his favour he had been constructively dismissed because in cutting Mr. Mostyn's pay, the employer had also breached an express term of his contract, the term relating to pay. So the question of reasonableness was irrelevant. There was a breach of an express term. The Employment Appeal Tribunal said there can never be reasonable and proper cause for breaching the implied term of mutual trust and confidence where the breach is a unilateral pay cut. And although the case ended up being about changing terms and conditions. That wasn't the main issue in the case. The employer's problem with Mr. Mostyn was his performance. Its downfall was in fudging that issue. What the company should have done was follow its capability procedure to address the employee's performance instead of imposing a pay cut which breached his contractual terms. A capability process would have resolved the issue one way or the other. Either his performance would have improved or he would have been potentially fairly dismissed. The company would have been much better equipped to defend any legal claims. So do employees have to actually resign in response to a serious breach? Well, even if the imposition of new terms is a serious breach of contract, entitling the employee to resign and claim constructive dismissal, they don't have to take that drastic step. A claim for unlawful deductions won't be affected if the employee chooses to carry on working. The claim could still be brought under the old contractual terms. The risk for you, the employer, is that the tribunal upholds the unlawful deductions claim because there's been no employee agreement to the new terms. And in so doing, the original terms of employment are also upheld held to be binding and you end up at square one and having to revert to the original contract terms unless you want to find yourself back in tribunal with another unlawful deductions claim. And an employer in that situation has to think afresh about how to bring about the necessary contractual change. Sometimes the contractual change is so substantial that the contract is effectively terminated. So in a case called Hogg and Dover College, one of my favourite cases, the employee was unilaterally demoted from head of department, suffering significant loss of status, 
his pay was cut by 50%, and his old job was given to someone else. The Employment Appeal Tribunal said the variation was so great that the employee had essentially been dismissed from one contract and re-engaged on another. And that meant he could bring an unfair dismissal claim because of being dismissed from that contract despite remaining in employment. Now, this is sometimes referred to as a, as a deemed dismissal. The employee is deemed to have been dismissed from the original contract. It's a situation you as an employer should be keen to avoid. Can the employee cherry pick? Sometimes a fresh set of terms in a reorganisation involves some pros and some cons for employees. If the changes are part of a fresh package, employees cannot say, cannot say that they'll accept some of the new terms, but not the more onerous ones. So in North Lanarkshire, Council and Cowan, the employer introduced a new working pattern that included fewer working hours, better hourly rates, but an unpaid lunch break. The lunch break had previously been paid. The employees objected and said they were working under protest. They then tried to accept the good bits of the deal, the fewer hours and the better pay, while rejecting the unpaid lunch break. The Employment Appeal Tribunal said that lunch breaks were an integral part of the whole package. If they hadn't accepted the lunch breaks, they hadn't accepted the whole deal, which meant they had no right, no contractual right, to the higher rates of pay. So what about when the employee refuses the change? There's always the chance that the employee will simply refuse to work to the newly imposed terms, and that will only happen if the employee has some sort of control over the change. In other words, where the change relates to an aspect of the job they can refuse to do, such as a change of hours or a change of duties. Now, this can be difficult to manage, especially if the employee refuses to resign. An obstructive employee can radiate bad feeling around the rest of the workforce and create unrest. So you might need to regain order by dismissing the employee, but that opens up the risk of the employee claiming unfair dismissal. Now, that kind of dismissal won't always be unfair. If an employee initially agrees to work under new terms, under protest, but then doesn't, they might be fairly dismissed for conduct reasons, a failure to follow a reasonable management instruction. It's a trickier situation to manage if the employee simply refuses the new terms from the outset. But in a case called Rochford against WNS Global Services, the Court of Appeal found that an employee was fairly dismissed for gross misconduct after refusing to carry out a, a, a partial role on return from disability sick leave. The employee had been off work for a year. On his return, the employer only allowed him to do some of his previous duties and refused to tell him when he could return to his full role. The employee refused to carry out the partial role but continued to be paid. The employer dismissed him for gross misconduct and the Court of Appeal upheld the dismissal. The request to carry out not only a partial role, sorry, the request to carry out only a partial role wasn't discriminatory. Let me get my head around this the right way. The request to carry out a partial role wasn't discriminatory and was within the employee's capabilities. However unreasonable the employer was in its approach, the employee's obligations didn't completely fall away so his dismissal was fair. Now, I do think that decision should be treated with some caution. Anyone returning from disability leave or long-term absence should be treated sensitively and there should be an open and honest discussion about duties. Reasonable adjustment should ideally be agreed with the employee in conjunction with occupational health advice if necessary. So in my view, that particular employer dodged a bullet. Imposing new terms. Now, the difficulty with imposing new terms is the lack of certainty. You don't really know what's going to happen. The risk of litigation is, is quite high, whether in respect of a claim for unlawful deduction from wages or breach of contract or constructive or unfair dismissal. Excuse me. Once you're in litigation territory, you'll have lost the trust of your employees and not only the ones who are directly affected, but others who they talk to in the staff room or on Facebook. It's a morale sapping exercise and it's really best avoided.
If you can't get the employee's agreement to change, the safest way to sort out a contractual change is to terminate the old contract and offer to immediately re-engage the employee on new terms. This isn't without risk, it's still a dismissal, but it avoids the type of uncertainty you get from imposing new terms and waiting to see what happens. You'll need to give the correct amount of notice to avoid a wrongful dismissal claim, but if the employee takes the new job and continues working, it's crystal clear from a legal point of view that they are now going forward under the new terms and conditions. Some employees who don't agree to the revised terms won't accept the new contracts and will simply leave at the end of their notice period. They might be able to bring straightforward unfair dismissal claims with the potential liability for loss of earnings that goes with that. I'll talk about whether they'd win or not in a second. Bear in mind also an employer can claim unfair dismissal even if they take up the new contract. That's because the dismissal is from the original contract. I mentioned the Hogg and Dover College case before. And that dismissal stands even though employment continues on their new terms. But their losses are limited because they're still being paid. So def to defend against this sort of claim, you as an employer have to prove, have to show a potentially fair reason to dismiss. And you have to show you acted reasonably in dismissing the employee for failing to agree the new terms. It's the same test as for any dismissal case. And remember, the employee has to have two years employment. If they've got less than two years, they can't claim. Usually, employers rely on some other substantial reason as the potentially fair reason for dismissal. They've got to show with good evidence, with good evidence, that they had a good sound business reason for imposing the, cha the, the change to terms and conditions and then dismissing because of the refusal to accept. Now, that reason doesn't have to be something that saves the business from ruin. It's not got to be that high. It's just got to be a sound business reason as judged by a reasonable employer and something that's not trivial. So imposing um, new restrictive covenants, if you've discovered that competitors are trying to poach your staff, would be a perfectly good and valid reason for doing this. And remember that Section 98 of the Employment Rights Act still requires you as employer to act reasonably overall in relation to the dismissal. What's reasonable will depend on the facts, it'll depend on the size of your business, it'll depend on the available resources. It's all relevant. And in the worst case scenario, an employment tribunal might end up analysing whether a refusal, sorry, whether a dismissal for refusing new terms is fair. It, 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 it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act between the reasonableness of your actions in trying to push through the change versus the reasonableness of the employee's refusal. And a tribunal might find the employee's re refusal was reasonable in the circumstances, but still go on to find the dismissal was fair because the employer's decision was reasonable too. The focus is on the employer's reason to dismiss in an unfair dismissal case. And the tribunal considers all the facts, including the reasons for you making the proposed changes, the financial, the organisational reasons, etc. The employee's reasons for rejecting the changes, whether any warning was given or reasonable notice was given of the changes, whether you as the employer explain the changes and their effect clearly to the employee, whether the employer considered the impact of the changes on the employees and considered softer alternatives, whether you tried to get the employee's agreement to the changes, there's all these factors, whether there was a proper consultation process, including listening to the employee's objections and responding reasonably to them and making any concessions where necessary. An example in a restrictive covenant case, if you're trying to impose covenants, might be to adjust the covenants you want to impose in order to say that employees can take with them any clients who they brought with them when they came to the job. So if they brought the clients to your job, they're allowed to take them when they leave. That might be a reasonable concession. A really important factor is whether most employees have accepted the changes. Because if 85% of employees have accepted the changes, it's more likely to be accepted and acknowledged as a reasonable change by a tribunal than if only 15% have accepted the changes. Then there's the stance of a trade union, whether the union recommends or objects to the change. If the union supports the change, 
as part of a package of negotiated changes and you've just got a few standout, standalone employees who are refusing to sign, well, you've got a pretty good chance of persuading a tribunal that a dismissal for uh, refusing to agree to new terms and conditions is reasonable. Now, although the ACAS Code of Practice uh, on disciplinary and grievance procedures arguably well, probably doesn't apply to this kind of dismissal because it's not really a disciplinary or grievance procedure. It is worth adopting the broad procedures to support any dis unfair dismissal defence. Following your own process is a given, but using the ACAS code shows you've adopted best practice. It bolsters your good business reason with overall reasonableness and makes your dismissal more likely to be fair. Now, I want to talk about collective consultation. Collective consultation provisions will apply if an employer is proposing to dismiss 20 or more employees from their existing terms within a 90-day period. And uh, module, I think it's module 7 in my course on getting redundancy right, www.gettingredundancyright.com, deals with collective consultation in a lot of detail. I spend about an hour and 20 minutes taking you through how you decide whether collective consultation obligations are triggered, how you do the collective consultation, what you need to discuss with the union, how you elect employee representatives, what the special circumstances defence is. So if you want to know more about this, if you're doing this for more than 20 employees, then you uh, do, I suggest, strongly need to get hold of Module 7 of www.gettingredundancyright.com. So what is collective consultation? Well, amongst other things, you've got to tell the Secretary of State about the plan using a form HR1, and you've got to follow the rules on collective consultation contained in Section 188 of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992. Consultation needs to start in good time and at least 30 days before the first dismissals. If you're proposing to dismiss more than 100 people, then consultation has to start at least 45 days before the first dismissal. The penalty for not doing this is a protective award of up to 90 days pay, roughly three months pay for each employee. That's a lot. For a business looking to pull in its purse strings, a protective award can completely undermine the business aim of the original change. Make sure you factor the collective consultation requirements into your overall process. Let's talk about best practice and top tips for making essential changes. It's important to remember your ultimate goal. Making changes to employment contracts is an essential part of running a business and an essential part of adapting to its changing needs. With a little forward planning and an open and honest approach with your staff, you can drive forward those changes while also minimising the risk of litigation. Communication is so important in this situation. Employers need to sell any deal to employees. These things can help. Be upfront. Tell employees why the changes are needed. Many employers want to change, term, term, change terms due to reorganisations aimed at saving costs and avoiding redundancies. If employees are staring down the barrel of a potential redundancy situation, they may see changes to existing terms in a different light. Think laterally. Do you need to do everything at once? Can you have a transitional period where the impact of the changes, especially financial ones, <clears throat> are brought in gradually to reduce the impact and allow employees to adjust to the change? Can you incentivize employees into agreeing the changes? This doesn't have to mean cold hard cash. Introducing lifestyle benefits such as flexible working or home working can be useful in getting employees on board with the proposed changes. Consider your timing. Try to be savvy about when you introduce changes. Can you link changes with something positive, like salary reviews? If something negative comes along at a time when something positive also happens, it's a less bitter pill to swallow. So some top tips for changing contracts. Try to reach agreement with the employee. Be creative and sell them your plan. Give the employee as much information as you can. Explain why changes are being made and highlight potentially worse alternatives. Follow the ACAS code and follow your own procedures. If dealing with large numbers of contractual changes, remember you have specific collective consultation obligations if you're proposing to dismiss and re-engage more than 20 employees within 90 days. 
So this includes the imposition of major contractual changes that lead to resignations or constructive dismissal. So take care here and scrutinise your proposal. Make sure your proposal doesn't indirectly disadvantage a particular group based on protected characteristics such as sex or race or age or whatever it might be. Don't fudge performance issues. Face them fairly, but head on. Make sure any changes to terms are put in writing, both for clarity and for legal compliance. Thank you for watching. In module four, we're going to move on to making changes to terms and conditions after a TUP transfer. Before we go there, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the HR Inner Circle, a membership club I run for smart, ambitious HR professionals. So let's go and have a look behind the scenes at the HR Inner Circle.